Drive 
God of abundantly more than we ask or think Lord you will never fail your name is powerful your words unstoppable all things are possible
He's our hope forever. He has made a way, the light tearing through the darkness. Jesus, our Savior. Heavenly Father, we thank you for making a way for us. We thank you for the ability to worship you. We thank you that you are real and seated at the right hand of the throne and that you make a way for us continually, day in, day out. No wonder we call you Savior. It's in your name we pray, amen, amen. Welcome to Man at Church, everyone. Y'all can go ahead and have a seat, have a seat. Sit down, sit down. You ain't gotta stand up for me being so formal. So good to see each and every one of you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is James. I'm one of the executive pastors here at Man at Church. And it's so good for each and every one of you to be with us today. But I want to give a special welcome to anyone who may be here for the very first time. So if you're a first-time guest, we'd love to get to know you better so that we can make sure that you get connected in a life-changing relationship. And the way we do that is really two ways. You can pull out your phone, pull out your messaging app, and text the word guest to the number you see on the screen. That's going to allow us to get to know you better. Or if you prefer to do the old-fashioned way, you can reach in the seat back pocket in front of you, pull out that guest card, and fill it out. Either way, we'd love for you to go see one of our serve team members that are wearing a orange here to serve shirt right after the service. We're going to put a special gift in your hand just a way of saying thank you and we hope to see you again. So Man of Church, let's make any and all of our first time guests feel welcome today. Awesome. And I so love worship. And one of the ways we worship is through our tithes and our offerings. And so we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to do that as well. So here's how we do that here at Man at Church. If you give online through the app or through the web and any of those online methods, you can continue to do that. We'd love for you to continue to do that. If you're prepared to give online today, you can text the word MANA to the number you see on your screen. That's going to allow you to give via PayPal. Or if you want to do it the old-fashioned way and you have tithes and offers that you'd like to deposit in today into your account with God, you can do so on your way out of the auditorium. You're going to see a sign that says give here. and There's a little bucket on these pub tables. You can put your offering right in there. And either way, we'd love for you to be blessed by giving in your offering to Jesus today. All right. One more thing. See, at Man of Church, we have our, a mission statement. And that is we, we aim to glorify God by equipping his people to change their world and also plant churches with the same world-changing vision. Now, our, our plan, church planting movement is called Multiply, and we, we aim to plant an expression of Man of Church all along the military highway. And the God is doing some amazing things along that military highway as we continue to multiply. Now, I could go on and on and talk about this, but better yet, let's turn our eyes to the screens and listen to this great story of how God is moving along the military highway. We are Aaron and Jamie Kellner. Um, we've been going to Mana Church since 2005. Uh, we started off at Mana Cliffdale. Uh, I was currently deployed to Afghanistan, um, and Jamie was invited to church by our neighbor. Coming to Mana was like nothing I had ever been a part of before. I was raised in a Baptist church, um, so very different, and immediately got involved in a women's small group, and then in 2014, we got some orders. We PCS'd to Hawaii. Um, we were there for about two and a half years um, before we got a call from Sean with the Allen asking us if we wanted to be part of the church plant uh, Hawaii. It instantly felt like home. I remember us both looking at each other going, this is manna, this is home, this is where God has called us to be. And we were deciding on our next uh, PCS where we wanted to go. Uh, it was between uh, Fort Carson, Colorado, or Fort Lewis, Washington. Uh, I got a call from my branch manager saying Fort Carson was available, and if you know, did I want to go? And I said yes, we will go to Fort Carson. So um, 
about a week later, yeah, I got a text from Michael Wiggins from um, mm. Cliffdale site saying, um, "Mana COS 2018." And we both looked at each other like, <laughs> no way. <laughs> so I quickly called him and got the details on that um, and found out that Joe and Alyssa Adams were going to be coming out here to plant um, Mana COS. And we were just floored at what God was doing, setting yes. up um, a family and friends for us um, in a place that we hadn't even <laughs> been to yet. You know, we're not even there, and God was providing community yes. for us already. After a few interest meetings, Joe asked us to come over and have a dinner where he asked, you know, how committed do you guys want to be? How involved do you want to be? And I remember going into that dinner um, because we knew what he was going to ask. And we said to each other in the car, we're going to say no. <laughs> and as soon as he asked, I immediately said, yes, I'm all in. <laughs> and Aaron said, what she said. <laughs> I think that we are in a place where our faith has never been before. Each one of us walking um, in our own relationship with Jesus, but also as a couple, as a family. Our marriage has never been stronger than it is right now with God at the center. Yes. Um, the unity in our family that we're seeing is um, just in a different place than it ever has been. Uh, we're, we're still walking through things. Things are still not perfect. Um, and, and we're still just praising God for what he's doing and how he's working and the fruit that we're seeing from from all of these different places that we've been and all of these different connections that we've had yeah. um, and the community that he's just been so faithful to provide every place that we've been. Hey there, Man of Church. How you doing today? Awesome Blossom. Well, my name is Jonathan. I'm the teaching pastor and it's absolutely my privilege to welcome you. And I want to extend that welcome, obviously, to everybody who's in the room with me right now. Also, every single person who's watching, whether I'm on a screen at one of our sites, which is right here in the Fayetteville, Fort Bragg region. You could be at Hope Mills or Anderson Creek or at the Rayford site and others, whether you're at a micro site, maybe you're there in New Bern, North Carolina. I always, I always want to say New Bern. I don't know why, but it just appeals to me. New Bern, uh, New Bern, or you could be at, at, um, in El Paso or San Antonio or Fort Leonard Wood, a number of other places. If you're watching on the internet, however you're apart, all together, those of us here, can we make those watching feel welcome? I've so been looking forward to this series that we're going to start today. Uh, if you watched the video that played right before I got started, you saw that that series is entitled When Your Back is Against the Wall. And I'm so excited to share it with you because I'm going to tell you a secret. You have to promise not to tell your neighbor or anybody. I know they're sitting next to you, but, you, you know, it's just you and me talking. They're not listening, okay? Um, this series actually came from a very special day that our staff had with our senior pastor, he came in and said, hey guys, I want you to pull out your Bible. So I'm gonna do the same thing to you. If you got your Bible, I want you to go ahead and pull it out. He said, I want you to pull out your Bible and we're gonna take uh, some time. We took a, a, actually a very extended chapel time. And he took us through some learnings that he had had from Psalm 143. And we're gonna take the next seven weeks and we're gonna walk through the same stuff looking at Psalm 143 and say, man, seven weeks, that is a long time to spend in a 12 verse chapter. And you're right, it is a long time to spend. But I gotta tell you that sometimes some of those powerful things that we learn, some of those powerful things I've experienced, some of those powerful things that my dad has taught me has come from spending 
a very long amount of time going over and over a passage, over and over a verse, and finding some really deep truth. In fact, we're going to walk through uh, four um, kind of big steps, if you will. No, better, because there are some steps in what I'm going to call the process. I'm going to call this four sections of this scripture. And I think God has something incredibly special for us. For myself in preparation, I've been reading Psalm 143 every single day, going over it and over it and over it and meeting God in that place. But before we dive in, I want to ask you a question, and it's okay to interact. Even if you're another site, that's okay. You can yell it out. I won't hear you. You'll be wrong, so I just know that, so it's okay that I can't hear what it is that you say, but you can go ahead and answer me. Uh, So here's my question. How do you throw an egg against a brick wall without breaking it? Ponder it for a moment, and then answer me. How do you throw an egg against a brick wall without breaking it? What are your answers? Give me your wrong answers. Go ahead, tell me. Hard-boiled egg, somebody says. Um, A whole bunch of things. But you know what? Your answers don't matter uh, because an egg could never break a big brick wall. Oh, we knew it was the joke, but it wasn't good enough. That's okay. I've got one more. <laughs> this joke relates to a wall. That's how I'm, your back's against the wall. This, okay. So a pharmacist walks in uh, to the pharmacy. He's been out on lunch and he finds a customer. His back's not against, against the wall. His whole body is leaning against the wall. And he's like clutched over himself. And so the pharmacist goes up to his assistant and says, hey, what's going on? What's the deal with this customer? And like, he's scaring the other customers. What can we do? And the guy said, well, to, to be honest, he came in and he was looking for a cough suppressant, but we were out. So I gave him an entire bottle of laxatives. Yeah, I'm just going to let that sink in. With the little ripples wave through. And the pharmacist says, man, you cannot cure a cough with laxatives. And the assistant goes, oh, yes, you can. Look at him. He's scared to cough. (laughs) Pastor Michael wanted me to tell you the one about the egg. So I added that one so that you'd have so that you'd have actual enjoyment. Don't listen to the peanut gallery. (laughs) You got your Bible. What he'd prefer me to say is that both jokes were his idea. You believe it if you want to. If you got your Bible, open it up with me, if you will, to Psalm 143. We're going to start going verses 1 through 12, but I want you, in fact... I hope you write in your Bible. If you got your Bible with you, I'd encourage you to go ahead and write some things in your Bible with me. If you didn't bring it, that's okay. Bring it next week because you know what we're going to be covering? Psalm 143. You're right. You you answered that one. That one was correct. That's how you break a brick wall with an egg. Um, Psalm 143. And so what we find, if we break this uh, chapter apart in verses one through four, we're going to find David, the psalmist, we're going to find him encounter the problem. And there's some uniqueness to the problem that probably all of us will relate to, and I think that's very special. So we'll look at that in just a moment. We'll find the problem. After that, in verses five and six, we'll find the process. I'm going to tip my hand. Here's what I want you to get. I want you to get the process. I think God wants you to get the process. We'll see as we walk through this psalm, he's got something special for you in the process. Over the next seven weeks, we're going to look in verses 7 through 10 at the prayers. We'll find seven unique prayers that David prays after he walks through this process. And the last two verses, what we'll see is the preservation. So you get your Bible, we'll put this up on the screen. But allow me to read these verses and I'll make some commentary as I go. And David the psalmist starts out and he prays, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. Again, this section 
is the problem. So we're getting that realization that he's in a tough place, that this is very difficult. He's crying out to God, I need mercy. I need you to show up. You know what he's saying? My back's against the wall. And he says this, in your faithfulness, answer me in your righteousness. As I said, his back's against the wall. He's in trouble. He's in trouble on the inside for sure. You can, if you read this, you can sense the angst. You can sense uh, that, that feeling that things are not right and his soul is not okay. He's in trouble on the inside. And then as we read a little bit deeper, we'll see he's on the trouble on the outside as well. But David has learned something. And if I'm all the way honest, it's something that I'm continuing to try to learn. And probably all of us are trying to learn as well because David has caught something here and he is not trying to muscle his way out of trouble. I don't know about you, but I know a lot of times when I find myself in trouble, when I find myself opposed, when I feel like my back is against the wall, I've got that temptation, that knee-jerk response to try to handle that difficulty or work that out in my own strength. That I think, I know what to do. I'm smart enough to figure this out. I'll find my way. But what we see David here doing is he's not going, I'm gonna rely on this great wisdom that I have. I'm not gonna work this thing out. I'm not gonna incorporate this person or that person. Instead, he is turning to God in that place. And he's not specific so much on what the trouble is or what has caused it, but he is very specific in what he's gonna ask God for. You read it with me, we read it together. He says, in your faithfulness, answer me in your righteousness. I know sometimes when we read through the Psalms, we, we read those words in your faithfulness and righteousness, and we might tend to look at that as, as the spiritual language that a person prays when they pray to God, but I really want us to update that, to think of that in our own words and kind of a modern lexicon, and what is it that he's saying to God? Because I'm gonna give you a turn of phrase that has been so beneficial in my life. Basically, here's what he's saying. He's saying, in your faithfulness. And, and what does God's faithfulness mean? What is faithfulness? It means that you are dependable. Or what he's saying to God is, you're good. In your faithfulness, you're dependable, you're good. And in your righteousness, what does it mean to be righteous? That you're true. The way I like to think of it, that you always and only do what is right. So David starts out this approach to God with his back against the wall, with his declaration, his confession. I give it to you. Take it, make it part of your prayer life when your back is against the wall. Basically, he looks at God and he says, you are good and you always and only do what is right. See, the temptation I would say, I don't know about for you, but in truth, I do know it's the temptation for you. It's the temptation for me, the temptation when our back is against the wall is to question God. Why is this this way? Why did this happen? See, we get so tempted all throughout life to feel like, hey, if I, if I do this thing, if I read my Bible, if I pray every day, if I love my spouse, if I'm kind to my kids, if I do it, like then nothing bad will ever happen. Anybody get stuck in that trap? Like, hey, it's just like, everything's gonna work out, everything's gonna be good, and if I face something and then I just remember, oh yeah, God, you need to be involved, then then it's just gonna go well for me. So that's because that's our temptation. Then when our back's against the wall, we start to question God. And in questioning God, a lot of times our perspective of our struggle shifts from thinking um, as we look at the struggle, we start to feel like we're struggling against God. So we're starting to question him. Hey, I'm not sure that you've got this right. Why am I in this place? And instead of asking his help, we're kind of going, what's going on here? 
But I love that reset that David has, and it's one that I try to incorporate in my own life where I go, wait a minute, in whatever is happening, why, for whatever reason I'm opposed, I want to remember when I go to God, you're good and you always and only do what is right. You know what that reminds me of? That God's not my problem. So what is David's problem. Verse two, he says this, enter not into judgment with your servant for no one living is righteous before you. There's some humility here as David is admitting that he's a sinner and at least some of this, and I'll be honest, at least some of whenever I'm back, my back is against the wall is my own fault. I put myself in that circumstance. We've got to admit, admit that at least some of our troubles are a result of us. So I don't know, Fletcher, well, that reminds me of Job chapter 5, verse 7, which, is, which says that man is born to trouble as sparks fly upwards. The women said, amen. That is true. Man is made for trouble like the spark flies upwards. But Job didn't just mean man. He meant humanity. So you were wrong and you shouldn't have said that. You should repent now. He continues, for the enemy has pursued my soul. He's crushed my life to the ground. He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. Here's my question. Which enemy? And to be honest, this verse is vague. So I looked it up. Who, who's the enemy here? Who is he talking about? You know what I found? I found that some commentators say that this enemy is Saul. I look at another close psalm and say he talks about being in a cave. So this is one of those psalms that David is writing out of that place where he's chased by Saul and he's trying to get away from him. So he has been pursued. I found some other commentators who said that this is likely from a section of Psalms that David wrote as he's being chased by another would-be king, Absalom, his own son, who is chasing him out of his city. And so David is finding himself against, again in this place where he's in trouble on the outside and trouble on the inside. There's all this angst. At the same time, this could be one of those psalms where David is talking about the enemy of his soul who is Satan. Could be spiritual. The truth, though, is it doesn't matter how he got there. The point is that his back is against the wall and he's in pain. To be honest, that's part of why I, I love the beauty of studying the scripture because it could be completely clear and we could be tempted to say, okay, this was a circumstance unique to David. But I think when we look at this and realize, well, it could be that thing or it could be this thing or it could be something that's just like why your back is against the wall. I think every one of us can find ourselves in this psalm and relate in this place and realize, yeah, I know that feeling. I'm familiar with what you are talking about here, David. Verse four, therefore my spirit faints within me and my heart within me is appalled. Just pause for a second. You think about that language and how fully upset and wrung out he is. His spirit faints. He's out of gas. He's worn out from trying and he cannot, I'm appalled I cannot believe how bad things are on the inside. I did not expect to be in this place. This wasn't a part of my plan. I thought if I did things this way, then this circumstance wasn't gonna show up in my family. How am I stuck here? This brings us to the process. In verse five, I'm gonna tell you to underline four things as we walk through this. Verse five, he gives us the first step. There's four steps. He gives us the first step in the process when he says, I remember the days of old. This is one of those places where as we step into this process, and this is not one of those things, we'll talk about this some more, this is not one of those things 
that I, I'm gonna go gra- gather a whole bunch of people. This is where my, uh, my back is against the wall. It's me and God. So this is done between me and God. This is in my devotional time and outside of my devotional time. This is as I'm running on the trail. This is as I'm driving on the road. This is in all those places where I just feel in that spot where I'm like, man, I can't make it. It's over my head. I don't know what to do. And so you stop. And I remember the days of old. I go backward to go forward. I recall, God, how you've been there for me in the past. I remember when I feel all alone and I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel and things are so difficult and I'm wondering, can God even show up? Will God even speak to me? It's like, stop. Let me look back at my own life. I'm going to remember where God showed up before. I'm going to remember what he did. I got this bad report. Oh, man, it looks like this sickness or that sickness. Wait, God's healed me before. He's spoken to me before. He's helped us here before. He's redeemed me before. He's set me free before. I've walked in this place. I remember the display of your power on my past. So I remember the days of old. And then I meditate on all that you've done. That sounds similar. I think it is, but it's different. Meditating is a deliberate act to choose to go over the details of past deliverances. And sometimes that's hard to do because we don't want to remember some of those things in the past and how God set us free. Sometimes God's calling us to look back and Remember how he walked us out of that dark place. To meditate, to mull over, to, to, to chew on. That's what meditate means. It means to chew the cut. So to, to chew on it and ponder it again and look at it over and over. This is personal. This could take an entire devotional time. This could be in one of those moments where there's you know, just incomplete struggle. And so you're going over it, meditating back over it again. It's not a one-time thing. It's not just like, oh yeah, God delivered me before. It's like, no, I'm gonna rehearse to myself, to my soul, what God did. Really? And who he is. Who he has been. In my, I remember I meditate, and then I love this. I ponder the work of your hands. See, remembering and meditating is a lot about what God has done uniquely and specially in my life, and pondering here is less personal and more theological, propositional. Pondering, you look out and you see the stars and the vastness. That's that moment where you go, man, look how great God is. I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes that's looking at what God has done in his word, what God has done over there, what God has done over here, and seeing that and all the rest of it going, man, God, you are good. You are awesome. You are holy. You are set apart. You are so mighty. I ponder the work of your hands. I look at the grandeur of the mountains, the fierceness of thunder and lightning, the work of your hands, everything that you've done, the vastness of your love, and that brings a response, which is the next step of the process. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Then he pauses. See, his only response is to lift up his hands as he's confronted with the power of God's hands. See, worship in the place of pain is some of the most powerful worship. And if you've been there before, you know that. When you're sitting there and you're overwhelmed by what has come against you, and it could be because of your own mistake, or it could be because of circumstance, or it could be because of what's going on with somebody else, or some loss, or some place of fear. And then in the midst of that place, as you ponder God and you remember, and you're looking, and then your heart starts to well up. And so you, you, you look and you behold God in that, in that difficult and desperate place. Your heart connects to his in worship, and it's so sweet, and he's 
so there. And he's so real in that spot. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 15 says, calls it really the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. See the temptation? I'm just gonna be honest with you. I'm gonna walk through these seven prayers. But the temptation for a lot of us, because what we wanna do is we wanna get out of the place of pain. The temptation is to say, sweet, okay, give me the prayers that he prays so I can pray those prayers quickly and get out of this place. But David has discovered that the secret is in the process because that's where he connects with God. The process is transform transformational. Something happens inside of us and this often, hear me, because for so many people, you come to this place, you've been tasted some of the sweetness in worship in this place, but you always see it as a momentary thing to try to get to the next. But this often requires patience. There's a phrase that God always works in us before he works through us. A lot of times it's in the process. It's meeting with him and having those sweet moments together and responding to him that God is working in us. So in that place, you stretch your hands out because something has happened and when your back's against the wall, you reach for the place that you can be rescued. It's your hands toward God. So let's take a look at these prayers and we'll cover the whole psalm every week in a different prayer every week and, and if you take a look at the screen, we'll put them up there. If you're watching one of our screens, I'm gonna to look to the side because that's where I can see it, but you'll see it underneath me. The first is in verse seven, which says, answer me quickly, O Lord, my spirit fails. And this is the prayer of desperation. So his prayer is, answer me quickly. He goes on, hide not your face from me. This is the prayer of presence and seeking God's presence, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. In verse eight, he prays, let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love. This is that prayer of hearing, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go. God, give me guidance, for to you I lift up my soul. Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord. It's a prayer of Deliverance, I have fled to you for rescue or for refuge. Teach me to do your will is a prayer of instruction for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me. It's a prayer of submission on level ground. For today, let me go back to the first prayer that he prays. Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails, which is the prayer of desperation. And as you as you read his words, you can read and you can sense and you can feel the pressure. You can hear some of the panic. My spirit is failing. I don't know how much longer I can do this. We all know that sense. We've all felt that sense. Sometimes we feel that because we've come to the end of our own trying. I tried and I tried. I can't make it anymore. I'm about to be consumed. I'm about to lose it. You know what this is? It's desperation. And God loves desperation. That's a little tough, Fletch. God loves desperation. God wants me to be in that place where I have to be desperate. God loves desperation, but not for desperation's sake. See, God loves desperation when it's combined with faith. When we say, I can't do this myself anymore, we just stop there, it turns into despair. But when we turn to God and say to him, I can't do this anymore, I need your help, then despair becomes desperation and we release God to act in our circumstance. 
See, I think that's why the process is so important as we get to this prayer, because I'm telling you, when you're living in that place and you go, you know what, I'm gonna turn to God, I'm gonna remember, I'm gonna meditate, I'm gonna ponder, as we're doing that and our hands start to stretch out to him, that's where faith is being kindled, that's where a moment that could have been despair is seeing a glimmer of hope, so it's not, okay, now I'll make it on my own, it's I couldn't, but God, you're there, and I know who you are. I know who you have been. I know who you are. I know who you can be for me. So I'm desperate for you to show up because you're the only answer in front of me. But that is faith. Now I'm gonna tell you what I don't mean by faith. Don't poke your neighbor. Because we've probably done all of these things, every one of us. What I don't mean is faking it until you make it. Sometimes that's the false definition of faith for us. We go, okay, I'm just gonna pluck it up. I'm gonna gonna put it on. I'm gonna show it off so other people can see and then maybe it'll turn out to be true. It's not faking it till you make it. It doesn't, it's not saying the right words. Let me go back and read the Psalm a little more carefully to see if I can get the exact words right for the prayer. That's not faith. It's not muscling yourself out of the situation, trying to talk God into something. Okay, anybody ever done that? Because I'm I'm just going to tell you the truth. I have. I prayed the prayer, and then I've been like, man, that didn't sound, I mean, there was no one there. And I prayed it in my heart, but in my heart, it didn't sound good enough. So it's like you take three steps back, and you're like, I'm going to take three steps and jump into this one. And that'll somehow equate to faith. That's not faith. Desperation is a powerful tool in the hands of God because with it, he brings us to a place where we surrender. Say, God, your way, not my way. Desperation is a tool in the hands of God because with it, he brings us face to face with his mercy and grace. That's what we need. Because he brings us to the end of ourselves, which is the beginning of real power. You know, it's funny. I was thinking about this. I was praying about it. I think it's so interesting. We're going to go through the rest of these prayers over the next several weeks. And even as we think about this process, I think about the fact that David was the man after God's own heart. So sometimes it in my Western, in my American, wanting to be successful and not wanting to have pain. This is as I study it and get through it. It's like, man, I want to get so good at the process that I don't find myself again in the pit. But you notice how many Psalms there are? There's 150. And David didn't write them all. And David got the process. But that didn't mean his back wasn't gonna be against the wall a whole bunch more times. Because David figured something out. And that is being in the pit with God is better than being out of the pit without him. I don't want us to miss that as we go, okay, I'm gonna learn the process so I never have to feel pain again. I'm gonna learn the process so I won't find myself in this place. The truth is, I want to learn the process so I'll always stay connected to God. So when my back's in the, against the wall, he can work in me and lead me where I need to go. Because even in the worst pain, if I'm with him, it's actually paradise compared to being pain-free and not with him. Desperation works because desperation makes us turn to God. And when we turn to him, that's faith. Not drumming it up, it's trusting him and faith releases his power into our lives. I wanna tell you one more story. You don't need to turn there, we're not gonna put it on the screen. You'd find it in Isaiah chapter 38 and it's the story of King Hezekiah. And Isaiah is the author of Isaiah. 
cleverly named. And so he writes us a story. He says, in those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. That's, that's bad. And Isaiah, the prophet, another way, I, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, thus says the Lord, set your house in order for you shall die. You shall not recover. And Hezekiah, it's just like you and it's just like me. When Hezekiah hears that news, he's desperate. But Hezekiah has figured something out. And he does something that I hope I would do. I'm not always sure I would do. Let me tell you what I'd be tempted to do. If Isaiah the prophet came and told me when I'm sick, I'm desperate, I'm looking for anything, seeking the physicians, I've been praying. I'm hoping there's a way out. If Isaiah the prophet came and told me, Jonathan, get ready. Get your stuff in order. You're going to die. Most of us have a reaction to that. Most stories would then look this way. And so Hezekiah reached out to grab the clothing of the prophet. Isaiah, look, man, you're the dude. You hear from God. You got that, that red bat phone that's connected up to him. You got to pray for me. You got to help me out. I need you to jump in for me. That's what we tend to do. I got bad news. L let, me, I, let me get dad. He's known God so long. He can pray and help me. Let me text the pastor. Hey, you got to pray for me. Let me text him a smoker. You got to help me. None of those things are bad, but I want you to see what Hezekiah does. Come back. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall. Why did Hezekiah turn his face to the wall? Because when you turn your face to the wall, the only face you see there is God's. Hezekiah turns away from Isaiah. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, please, O Lord, remember, have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah Go and say to Hezekiah, thus the Lord, the God of your father, I have heard your prayer. Thus, thus says the Lord, the God of your father, I've heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. Behold, I'll add 15 years to your life. I think that's such a beautiful story because Hezekiah gets the news and he has no more time for Isaiah because the truth is Isaiah can't help him. He turns to the only one he can. And in turning to God, faith is ignited. And so he reaches out and God hears him. And God says, hey, Isaiah, listen, guess what? You're usually good at this, but go back. Tell them I've answered his prayer. I'm going to close with the final two verses of the psalm. The preservation. It says, verse 11, for your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. And in your steadfast love, will you cut off my enemies? And will you destroy all the adversaries of my soul? For I am your servant. This message, these lines, the psalm brings back some familiar lyrics of some of the worship that we sing. In fact, in our services, we just sang it a couple moments ago. You're familiar with these lines. I won't sing them. Make way through the waters. Walk me through the fire. Do what you are famous for. It's a prayer to God. What you, God, are famous for. Shut the mouths of lions. Bring dry bones to life. And do what you are famous for. I love how David ends this song. 
I read it a moment ago, I'll read it again. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. And in your steadfast love, you will cut off my enemies and you will destroy all the adversaries of my soul, for I am your servant. See, David ends with a voice of hope and a voice of humility because he has been this way before. And he knows that God will do what he's famous for. If you could bow your heads, let's pray. Lord, we come to you. I have no idea what's going on in each situation that's in this room, that's in these rooms, that's in the rooms where people are watching on the internet. But I know you do what you're famous for. So I come to you and I ask you humbly, Lord, will you help us? Will you help us learn like David did? Make us people of the process. Pray for every single person here, every single person watching. Lord, let us be defined by being people of the process. That we'll turn to you when our back's against the wall. That we'll remember what you've done. That we'll meditate on how you've rescued us. That we'll ponder the work of your hands. And that our hands will stretch out to you. Answer us as we pray in desperation. Walk us through the fire. Do what you are famous for. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your heads bowed for just one more moment, for just one more prayer. The most famous verse that Jesus is famous for is the verse in John chapter 3, verse 16, which says that God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's what Jesus is famous for in all the lives of those of us who have trusted him. And we've come to that place where we've realized that we cannot make our way out of our sin. We cannot find our way to relationship with God on our own. We've screwed that up from sin. But Jesus has stepped in to make that way for us. And I recognize that many of us are in that place and just hearing those words brings us again that that feeling of awe and excitement that God has done that for us. But I also recognize that you might be here in this site or in one of our sites, in any one of our services, and you're not at the place where you know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You may know everything there is to know about Jesus. You may be able to tell me every story in the children's storybook Bible. But if there's nobody else, and it was just you and me, and I asked you, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Have you turned over your sins? Have you repented of your sins and you're trusting him alone for your salvation? You're not sure what you'd say or you know that you'd say, I'm not trusting him. Now's the moment to know. Now's the moment to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. At every single one of our sites in this room, I, your site pastor, we're standing by right now to pray with you. If that's you and you say, I wanna put my trust in Jesus. We're not gonna embarrass you, but we do wanna know who it is that we're praying with. So all across this room at every single one of our sites, if you say, I'm ready to put my trust in Jesus, I wanna ask you right now to hold your hand up high. Say, that's me, Jonathan. I need Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Just slip your hand up over on this side. Thank you so much, great. Just slip your hand up and then put it right back down. Anybody other than these couple? Yep, over here, thank you so much. Super, awesome, thanks. You can go ahead and put that hand down. Anybody else, just slip that hand up and then put it right back down. In fact, as you put it down, if you raise your hand, you can go ahead and open your eyes, look up at me, look at the seat in front of you. There's a little booklet that says, I raised my hand. That booklet's yours. I want you to take that home. I want you to read it. It's got some great next steps for you as you follow Jesus. But we put a card in that booklet. I'm gonna tell you now, that card is not yours. That card is ours. What you need to do with that card when we're done praying is you need to fill that card out and then you can leave it on your seat or you can give it to anybody who's wearing a Here to Serve t-shirt because we wanna get a hold of you. We wanna see if we can help you as you journey with Jesus. We wanna be a resource to you. 
So fill that card out when we're done praying. Leave it on your seat. We'll get a hold of you. We'll start this process, this journey with you. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray out loud right now. I'm going to ask every person in the room to pray out loud after me. We're going to join with everyone who's asking Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. All together, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I pray that you would cleanse me. Make me right with God. Right now, I'm ready to put my trust in you. I put my faith in you. I put my hope in you. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. From this moment forward, I'm going to follow you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's put our hands together for anybody who prayed that prayer.